All of life's a song? Let's talk about that. Good afternoon, everybody. It's your music teacher, Mr. Halverson, here at the home of the Rouse School Mustangs, and welcome to episode two of Good Mythical Music Thursday. As you can see, I am in the kilt, and I'm holding a ukulele because I'm working on some special stuff for next week when I post a video for you on Monday for the next Can't Stop the Music Challenge. So today's question is, all of worlds a song? We're going to talk about that now. Now, this is a concept that has similarities both in written literature, things like poetry, as well as music. In poetry, there's this thing called a ballad, which is a piece that is written that helps tell the story about something. In music, we've got something as well, too. It's a piece of music that helps tell a story. Now, this is an incredibly old concept, and it's very easy for our minds, because of the things that we've experienced in life, our minds automatically go to something like, when the humble bard graced the right along with Geralt up. Well, you get the idea. Our minds go to this medieval time frame, these uh, epic tales of lords and ladies, kings and queens, in which bards and troubadours would regale people with these different songs. And in troubadours' cases, oftentimes regale them with songs of forbidden love, usually involved a lady who's promised to be married to someone else, or maybe it's the queen themselves. And if this forbidden love was found out about, they would be put to death. But alas, they're not in my life as it is anyway, so my life is dead on the inside. We're not going to talk about that aspect too much because let's be honest history has beaten that dead horse so we're going to go on and talk about other things a ballad a piece of music that tells a song and this has been going on from way back then to the current time frame now i could give you some love song ballad examples but that's a bit cliche and there's plenty of them out there so i'm going to give you a piece that is classic and it's timeless its music video is not but the piece of music itself that represents this is an absolute timeless classic. Uh, this is a piece of music done by Tim McGraw, and it's called Don't Take the Girl. And right now, Dollars to Donuts, one of your moms just said, oh, that is such a nice song, and she's right. It is a great song, and it's a wonderful example of a ballad. All of life's a song. We've got all these pieces of music that tell us stories about life. So going way far back, the ballad sets the stage of this entire concept for us. So I hope that you enjoy that one, Tim McGraw's Don't Take the Girl. That's the next video that we've got in the playlist. Continuing on with this concept of how all of life's a song, we get this thing thanks to the same folks that brought us the Panzer tank and the Autobahn. That's right, the Germans. They bring us a different variation on this, taking it the next step further. It's called a Zingspiel which literally translated means sing, play, where we take these different pieces of music that help tell a story, but there's acting involved with it as well. So play, not as in we're gonna go outside and throw a ball, play is in a stage performance. And these two are brought wonderfully together. Probably the most famous Zingspiel that we have available to us was written by a composer that we've talked about before, Mr. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who in 1791 writes The Magic Flute. Now, The Magic Flute's kind of crazy. It's a bit fanciful. A guy is given a set of magic bells that ring and a magic flute to help thwart the bad guys. There's this love story in there where a guy falls in love with a girl, but her mom ends up being this evil queen queen of the night. She gives her daughter a knife to kill this evil sorcerer. People are trying to stop other people and overthrowing. And then somehow Egyptians, gods and goddesses get brought into the mix in these trials. And you end up having this uh, kind of a battle between light and darkness. And thank you, Mozart, for giving us the ending that you did where light does triumph over darkness. So kind of an interesting piece a classic example of what a Zingspiel is, it translated from the German uh, uh, song play, or uh, sing play. Um, and this example that I've got is from the aria 
which is sung by the queen of the night. And you're going to see in here where she gives her daughter this knife to go and kill this sorcerer guy. Okay. Now it's sung in a foreign language, but it's got the English subtitles on the bottom. So you can keep track of what's taking place with that. So we go from ballad to Zingspiel, thanks to the Germans, which leads way into a much more familiar to us uh, genre known as a musical. In fact, the Zingspiel in the 1700s brings us into and sets the stage where in here in the United States in the 1920s, 1930s, gives us what we eventually have today as the musicals that we are familiar with. This idea of a play with a musical setting where those songs back up what's going on and help tell the story of what's taking place. Now, an example that I want to share with you today is uh, from a film version of a musical called The Music Man that was originally written by Meredith Wilson. Uh, this is from the 1962 version of the film. And the song that is taking place is called The Wells Fargo Wagon. Now, in The Music Man, this fellow, Mr. Professor Harold Hill, as he calls himself, comes to River City, Iowa, and he's kind of a grifter. He's kind of a bad guy. He's a con man, and he cons communities into starting these boys' bands, kind of like a marching band. They've got the uniform, they've got the instruments, the whole nine yards together, and he's got this revolutionary thing called the Think System, where they don't actually read music. If you can think the minuet in G, you can play the minuet in G, he says to the boys in River City, Iowa. Well, he ends up duping the school board at the school, uh, Mayor Shin, who's in charge of the town and his wife, and he kind of beguiles or, or uh, kind of bewitches everyone into believing all these wonderful things, except for one person in the entire, well, two people in the entire town, a friend of his, Marsalis, who lives there, and he has a hankering for this guy, Ethel Hoffelmeyer, if I'm remembering correctly, who uh, plays the player piano. She, she pumps the bellows, and it does everything else. That's all that she does, but everyone loves her for that. So Marcellus is a friend of his, knows that this is what he does, isn't going to interrupt him, and he's comfortable here in River City, Iowa. He's made a, a place for himself. The other person who doesn't fall to any of this is the librarian named Marion. So what's happened is he's gone through the town. Uh, he's gotten all of these parents to sign up their children to be in this boys band, and now the Wells Fargo wagon has arrived hopefully with the instruments and the uniforms for this boy's band. So this piece of music is um, the Wells Fargo Wagon. Now in this video, you're gonna see a couple faces that you might be familiar with. One of them, there'll be a line of people that are all together singing all of these different things that are hopefully coming to them on the Wells Fargo Wagon. There's a gal who's going to say, or dishes, she, was also in the uh, the film White Christmas. Um, she kind of helps run the hotel that the general owns. Uh, she's also in films such as Sister Act, which you've seen as well. Uh, you'll probably recognize her, and you'll probably also recognize a gal by the name of Shirley Jones, who was on the series The Partridge Family. You've seen her in that 70s show. And more recently, she played Teddy Duncan's grandmother in the Disney series, which is now done, unfortunately, called Good Luck Charlie. So I hope that you enjoy the Wells Fargo wagon from The Music Man. So that's our example of what a musical is. Now, if we have more music and a little bit less singing, we have what's called an operetta. It's a short opera, usually on the lighter humorous side, kind of a theme, having more spoken dialogue. And a lot of the most common um, authors and composers of these operettas are guys like Offenbach, Johann Strauss, Lehrer, and my personal favorites, Mr. Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, in fact, they end up writing a piece which is first performed in the year 1879, which is still a classic today, called The Pirates of Penzance. Now, in The Pirates of Penzance, and this is rather comical, by the way, uh, that features a fellow by the name of uh, Frederick, whose parents die, but before they're both gone, talks to the nanny and says, make him apprentice to a pilot, a ship's pilot, a ship's captain, so that he knows how to uh, sail and uh, you know he'll be able to make a good living and be able to take care of himself. Well, the nanny 
was a bit hard of hearing and heard apprentice him to a pirate. So he ends up being apprenticed to this pirate band, the Pirates of Penzance, and his 21st birthday has finally arrived. And upon his 21st uh, year or birthday, he's uh, free of the, his indenturedness to them and uh, gets to go on and live life where he chooses to be this respectable, upstanding citizen. Now, keep in mind, his whole life, he's been living as a pirate and loves these men like brothers in arms. And now he's going to become Joshimo citizen where he's going to be dedicated to the extermination of these very men that he grew up with. So there's this whole comical thing that takes place there. He falls in love with this gal by the name of Mabel, who has a ton of sisters. Their father's a major general. He comes on the scene. There's conflict between him and the pirate king of the Pirates of Penzance. And they find out that later on, as he's pursuing this life, he being um, Frederick, pursuing this you know, upstanding citizen life, the pirate king and his nanny show up one night and say, hey, guess what we found out, okay? There's a technicality and you're still a pirate. You're not an upstanding citizen because Frederick, you were born on February 29th, which is a leap year. And Frederick said, this is no big deal because I'm only indentured to you until my 21st year. And the pirate king says, no, until your 21st birthday. There's this little paradox and they sing a song about that. And Frederick says, but according to my natal day, I am a little boy of five and everyone laughs. But then he has to realize the stipulation was to his 21st birthday, not his 21st year and hilarity ensues and everything works out in the end. So what I have for you here is uh, one of the pieces that is sung by the modern major general, one that I'm awful fond of and very familiar with. Because when I was in college, I was in a college production of the Pirates of Penzance where I played this character, the modern major general. And he ends up singing in this particular piece, this tongue twister set of lyrics. I hope you enjoy it from Gilbert and Sullivan's The Pirates of Penzance. That's our example of an operetta. That leads us to the next thing that so many people in life hate, and I get it, operas. And as a trombone player, if I have to play their music, I'm not excited about it because trombone music for an opera means that I sit like the first 47 measures of the piece of music and then I play 17 notes and then I sit for, I just forget about counting measures and I don't play anything for the next 15 minutes and then I play four notes. But it's not necessarily that terrible of a thing an opera. Now, how it's different than a musical is that in a musical, singing is interspersed with passages of dialogue throughout. And an operette has got that as well, okay? While in an opera, the singing never really stops. Although there are some operas where it kind of does, and there are these passages or speech-like sections that are called recitatives, but most of the time they're sung completely through without any spoken dialogue. Now there might not be singing, but there's almost always music going through all of them. A lot of times our minds go to the Vikings and Brunhilde who's singing the Viking uh, maiden with the horns on the top of her head, which is why we have the nice little Viking poster in the very beginning of the video here. Here, but a lot of it's just not about that. A lot of it is written in a foreign language, foreign for us anyway, um, but others aren't. The one that we're going to take a look at today is one that we can kind of relate to, sort of, and that's why I've picked this one out, the context of it. This one's called Madame Butterfly. It was originally written by a Giacomo Puccini in 1904, and in it, uh, keep in mind, this is 1904, so we haven't gotten to World War II yet, but through World War II, we can kind of understand some of this. There is this Japanese girl who's just kind of disillusioned about life, who falls head over heels for this U.S. naval officer who's kind of like this, well, he isn't kind of, he's this womanizing moron, and she falls madly in love with him, and it's this tale that shows who they are, who their friends are, and what ends up happening, sadly, in the end. Um, taking place in Japan and being sung in Italian, which is kind of a bit of a mind trip for us, and we find out what's going on with that. The selection that I have for you, the lead character, the Japanese girl who has fallen in love with this U.S. naval um, officer, is singing to her friend, and her friend's asking, when's he coming back? Because he's who's 
paying your rent on this place that you're living in and stuff like that. And she's saying, oh, he's coming back and he loves me. And her friend's like, are you sure? Are you sure he's coming back? Why is he going to come back? Because so many of these folks that are not from here who come and marry people here oftentimes go away and don't come back. And the girl who's in love with the U.S. Naval officer kind of escalates things quickly and essentially says, shut your stupid mouth or I'm going to kill you. Now, she says it in different words, but now you and I both understand what's taking place here. So the selection is that conversation. And then she goes on about how she's in love with him and how he loves her and how life is going to be when they meet each other again. Okay. Now, a reason why we can kind of not necessarily relate to, but it's not a complete foreign concept of, we think of World War II, and the Navy was hugely involved with that. And we think of all these different places where the Navy went, and they liberated all of these, all of these uh, islands, places like the Philippines, and we think about some of the relationships that took place there. So it's not a completely foreign concept to us. Um, it's something that we can kind of understand a little bit, and this opera is written about it. And it's called Madame Butterfly by Giacomo Puccini. It's written in uh, 1904. It's sung in Italian. It's got the English subtext on the bottom of that. After you get through that, you're probably going to be ready for something else, which brings us to our last example, an opera buffa, which is one of my favorites. It can be similar to an operetto, uh, but uh, it's longer and there's a lot more singing than what there actually is speaking. An opera buffa, a comedic opera, okay? The one that I'm going to have for you is an example from a rather comical one called The Abduction of Figaro. It's a comic opera. Um, it was described as, quote, a simply grand opera by PDQ Bach. Now, I as well as a number of folks who went through the music department here in Sydney, Sydney High School, sang pieces and played pieces written by PDQ Bach. Now, when we look at composers, we have their birth, uh, birth year and we have the year that they died. Now, PDQ Bach, he's got an interesting little situation with that. Okay, for PDQ Bach, they've got him listed as being born in the 1800s, but actually dies in the 1700s with a question mark next to that, which leads us to believe that PDQ Bach is not a real person. He's not. And actually, um, the composer who writes as PDQ Bach is a guy by the name of Peter Schickler. Um, the Abduction of Figaro is a parody of opera in general, and the title is a play on two different operas written by a guy we've talked about already, Mr. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. It's kind of a smashing together of a, a piece called The Abduction from the Siragalio and The Marriage of Figaro. Um, and a couple of other things too, Cozy Fontuti and Don Giovanni, as well as something that we've talked about as well, a little bit of mingling of Gilbert and Sul Sullivan's uh, The Pirate's of Penzance, okay? So there's a whole lot of comedic things taking place in this. Figaro, who's apparently dying, he's being mourned by this group of friends and people, including his wife, whose name is Susanna, Susanna Dana, and his doctor, Al Donfonso, is there. Now, someone else named Donna Donna breaks in, starts hurling accusations at this fellow by the name of Donald Giovanni, who soon appears in all this discomfort Comfort is averted by the intrusion of a guy by the name of Captain Cad, who kidnaps Figaro by turning his bed into a boat and sails away. And the rest of it is just absolute hilarity. Um, this ends up being written by Mr. Uh, Shakella for the Minnesota Orchestra in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was actually performed there at Orchestra Hall, not too terribly far away from a college that I used to go to. Um, and this was commissioned in the year 1984. So it's relatively recent. Um, I wanted to give you something to be able to, to laugh at. There are a number of comical things that take place. Um, it's all in English so you can understand it. And I hope you enjoy that. So yes, all of life can be a song, and it's a concept that's been around for an incredibly long period of time. Now, moms and dads, I want you to know, all of these different examples that I have here, different pieces, is a way that I can introduce our students to these different genres of music. If something catches your fancy, depending on how every family's got its own different rules about the things that we feel comfortable about 
our families watching, our families reading, and our, our uh, families seeing. So if the, one of these strikes your eye and you think, I want to sit down and watch that, maybe go through it. I'm not saying that there's questionable content in it, but every family has got its own rules. Take a perusal of itself if you're looking at the whole full thing, because a lot of these things on YouTube, you can see the entire full-length production of them. Um, just to make sure that this is within the accordance of, of what you guys have for rules at home. So all of these different pieces here are, are good examples of these different things. Abduction of Figaro has some kind of humor that you will find in a lot of cartoons today, unfortunately, but it's a good example as far as what the different genre is. So before I go, I gotta make sure that I give a quick shout out to Mr. Ziggy, Mr. Gunner, Miss Mallory, and Miss Megan. Thank you, uh, moms, for leaving comments for them in regards to last week's uh, good mythical music in Can We Serve Our Country as Musicians. I'm glad that you enjoyed the music. Yes, I'm a fan of that swing as well too. Although I've got to admit the US Army Field Band did a better performance of In the Mood if you watch that later video but it's all good, it's fantastic musicianship. So before I go, let's not forget, number one, every day be helpful at home, both today and every day. Number two, give your folks a hug. Number three, tell someone you love them. And number four, we'll see each other again when we get done during this time of exile and education. Have a good Thursday, everybody.